Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I just want to say thank you for attending today's Aging with Pride session for the 2SLGBTQ seniors and allies, and thanks to for our partners at SAGE and the Pride Centre of Edmonton. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to acknowledge that we're located on, tre on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our lives. Just two housekeeping items. Um, as you will have seen, that today's session is being recorded. If you'd prefer that your image not be used, please turn off your camera. And secondly, uh, just to remind you that our meetings are a safe space, remind you a couple of items. Please uh, respect the speaker by remaining muted during her presentation. We'll unmute you for the Q&A following that. Uh, please be mindful of time limitations and keep your questions and comments as brief as possible so that everyone can participate. Everyone who wishes to will be given an opportunity to ask a question before individuals who have not already spoken and uh, respect the confidentiality of personal information. So with that, great pleasure. We we're just chatting before about history. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Shirley Lowe. She's a local historian who is with Edmund, who was Edmonton's Historian Laureate from 2012 to 2014. She has co-authored two local histories, edited a third, and produced papers on the value of heritage pres preservation and Edmonton's urban neighborhood evolution. Her topic is Edmonton, two cities, two towns, and two villages, a historic overview of the six municipalities that became part of Edmonton between 1892 and 1964, uh, and considers why these areas grew outside of Edmonton and how they became part of the city. Shirley, um, definitely want to hear this from you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm here on behalf of the Edmonton and District Historical Society. This is um, history in the, in the community program. And um, and as um, Eric was saying, this is going to be a presentation about the municipalities and basically the growth of Edmonton. Uh, so I'm going to um, get into the share screening thing now. And um, all right, perfect. All right. Okay, so one of the things that I'd like everyone to consider is their own stories in this. <laughs> Excuse me. The uh, a couple of uh, um, a couple of these municipalities will be in the memories of people who have uh, who have lived here for any significant amount of time. So please feel free to ask any questions or put in your own insights and and experiences. All right, well, let's get started. So we're going to start with uh, with why admission was here in the first place. It was um, a fur trading post. So the first Edmonton house was built in 1795 at the junction of the North Saskatchewan and the Sturgeon Rivers. And, um, and it was there because the Northwest Trading Company built Fort Augustus. And they were, um, the um, Hudson's Bay Company considered them impinging on their territory. So as they noted in their um, files that uh, they had built Edmonton House within rifle distance of Fort Augustus. So the, the, uh, they both built and were trying to trade for furs at um, the, what's probably closer to Fort Saskatchewan than it is to the current um, uh, Edmonton, but it, um, it didn't last all that long, and both of the forts moved on to um, the second location in 1801, and we used to think that that was at Rossdale, but, um, but they've done excavating uh, for all kinds of things, the, the, the uh, 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 bridges and whatever else that were in that area, and, um, and they found no evidence of the second um, location. So they think that it's either at the golf course or somewhere in Riverdale, and they're not about to dig up any of that right now. So on to the third. In eight, nine years later, they're at Smoky Lake. And that um, 
turned out not to be all that successful either. So three years later, they did move into what we um, uh, consider Rossdale now. Uh, the um, Northwest Company basically imploded at that point. So the Hudson's Bay Company took over all of the operations of the Northwest Company in 1821. So from then on, there was no more Fort Augustus. It was just Fort Edmonton and the Hudson's Bay Company. So we know that the Fort Sis or the North Saskatchewan River floods on a fairly regular basis. And there were two really huge floods in um, uh, in the early part of the 1800s, and that sent them uphill a bit. So they their last the last Fort Edmonton was where the uh, Bowling Green area is at the Alberta Legislature. So that was the fifth and the last Fort Edmonton. So this is uh, a picture or a, a map of um, of. Uh, Canada at Confederation. And you can see that, um, that Quebec and Ontario are, are um, slivers of what they are now. And, um, and the, the four uh, founding provinces, which would be Quebec, Ontario, uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, are, um, are the 1867 version of Canada. And what you can see too is that Rupert's land, which was the land that was um, chartered to the Hudson's Bay Company by um, King Charles II in the, and uh, Rupert, Prince Rupert was his cousin. And he was, uh, he was one of the, uh, the um, well, he had a, he, uh, the owners, I suppose, of the Hudson's Bay Company. And so sight unseen, and regardless of the people who had already established a life on um, in this area, uh, the uh, the King of England decided that the Hudson's Bay Company would have jurisdiction over all land that had water flowing into the Hudson's Bay. No one had an, any idea what that was, but as, as you can see on the map, it was huge. So in 1870, as part of the deal with uh, British Columbia that uh, would provide them a connection with Eastern Canada or with Canada at that time, uh, the, um, the Dominion had to purchase and work with uh, the uh, with Hudson's Bay Company to, uh, to gain control of Rupert's land. And they did that, the Privy Council gave them permission to negotiate and they purchased Rupert's land for a million dollars and 55,000 acres. So part of that settlement was that the Hudson's Bay Company got to set up a reserve around their forts, their current forts, and, um, and frankly, a lot of land, 55,000 acres was huge. So 3,000 of those acres were in around their fort in Edmonton. And the original, the original um, Hudson's Bay Reserve was what is um, what is now in modern Edmonton, from the river to 118th Avenue, from 101st Street to 121st Street. And as soon as they did that in 1870, uh, the people started to claim the river lots around it. And um, now remember that um, the Dominion surveyors didn't arrive in Edmonton until 1882. So basically they were squatting on this land. It was all of it outside of the Hudson's Bay land would have been Dominion land at that point, but they were establishing their territories, which were the river lots. And the river lots, um, if you notice that um, the Hudson's Bay Company Reserve is a big rectangle. Well, river lots have a different um, plan. They uh, they run perpendicular to the river, so they get wonky. You can see, and I think you can see how they narrow off towards the top. The river lot rules for um, for the Edmonton area was north of the um, the river. The uh, the where the the river lots were uh, even numbers, and on the south side they were uh, they were odd numbers. So we start with the cities. The first city, of course, was Edmonton. And the um, Edmonton settlement 
uh, work to um, or establish itself just east of 101st Street. If you're wondering why our city hall and all our municipal uh, government uh, uh, departments are are mostly or were mostly east of 101st Street, was because they were the Hudson's Bay Company uh, had um, had the land west of it, and um, and so. The Hudson's Bay Company in um, 1881 established or subdivided their their first portion, and that was from the top of the bank to um, a road that they dug out and called Jasper Avenue. And Jasper Avenue was named after a fur trader who had never seen Edmonton, in fact, was dead by this time. And but it was on the way to uh, a town or a settlement called Jasper, and it was a fur trading post as well. So the um, the Hudson's Bay Company subdivided their portion on the grid. They were the first urban developer in the Edmonton area, and they were the ones who put to, who uh, who uh, demised their their portion in into a grid formation. So in the 1890s, you can see that um, Jasper Avenue was primarily uh, wooden facades. They was, it was almost a temporary town. 1891, the first train arrives. Now, the, tra the problem with the train was that um, the Carlton Trail, which was between Fort Gary and Fort Edmonton, Fort Gary is Winnipeg, uh, was the main highway of the fur, fur trade. It was it was a, a very busy, busy roadway or trail, I guess. And um and so it was it was thought that when the the um the train was was being or the, the route of the train was being determined that that would be the natural way to go because the Yellowhead of course is an easier pass than uh, than uh, the southern one. And um but that didn't happen for two reasons. One was that the memory of um, the American invasion was, um, or at least the threat of the American invasion was, was primary, and um, and so the Dominion wanted to make sure that they established their own territory or, or turf rights by having the train run as close to the border as possible. Um, on the other hand, the, the um, Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, the investors wanted to trade with the Americans, so it worked out that they that they took the southern route, and um, and that was a great disappointment for the Hudson's Bay Company and for the settlement of Edmonton in 1881, which was the year that the train arrived in Winnipeg. And um, but ten years later, uh, the train comes up from Calgary, uh, the Calgary Edmonton Railway, and arrives on the south side. Now, the Canadian Pacific Railway uh, refused to go across the river. And um, as they had done in Calgary, they came in and the settlement of Calgary was on the opposite side of the river and they basically forced the settlement over to the train side. But the Edmonton people wouldn't go over. So that was, that was the issue there. Um, 1892, Edmonton became a town it had a population at that point of 700 people. The um, train arrives and, and Edmonton grows. So 1900, the Edmonton Bridge, which is now the low level, it didn't become the low level until there was a high level. And um, it was built in 1900. In 1902, the Edmonton Yukon and Pacific Railway crossed the river over that bridge. And um, and it was uh, the low level bridge was uh, was a basically a gift from uh, from uh, Wilfrid Laurier and company, uh, mostly because Edmonton voted liberal. Uh, you'll find that there's a, there's uh, uh, there are a lot of of, uh, of political gifts that happen and continue to happen actually. So Edmonton became a city in uh, in 1904. The population by then had risen to over 8,000 people. Now, oh, I didn't take the F out of the Canadian Northern Railway. <laughs> it arrived uh, on 104th Avenue in 1905. And this was the first direct connection, uh, in a national connection. So now the area had two connections, two uh, uh, transcontinental connections 
uh, railway connections. So number two arrives 1905. Um, the city of Edmonton uh, gives them um, some land uh, on 104th Avenue and they build their first train station uh, in the city on the west side of 101st Street. So if you remember where the uh, where the casino was um, and where the rail yards and, and the, the freight yards were, uh, that was the first um, railway uh, station uh, in, in Edmonton, on the Edmonton side. Um, next, that was the same year that Alberta became a province. And in 1906, because uh, Rutherford had become premier, was a liberal, we became the capital of Alberta. So that was the um, the third connection, the third national or transcontinental connection was 1909 when the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway arrived. Now, both of these railways, the Canadian Northern and the Grand Trunk, Trunk Pacific came in on the north side of the river. So this established the Edmonton side or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the north side now as the dominant side. Boom. 1910-12 was the height of the real estate and building boom. The, um, the city's population by 1912 had grown to well over 53,000 people. People, this was the, the, the era of great immigration. It was also the time that, that the city built everything, all of, its, all of its founding infrastructure, its roads, its subdivisions, its streetcar expansion. The first streetcar was in 1908. Uh, the brick and stone buildings replaced the wooden buildings. So in the middle, um, in the middle photo there on the top, that's 1910 Jasper Avenue at 101st Street. So you can see that um, I don't know uh, how many, uh, if anyone remembers the uh, the old uh, Empire Block. It, it burned in the mid '60s and was replaced by the Empire Building, which is there now. It was the McDougal Secord um, business building, and um, uh, and they they built both of them. Uh, the several things happened. Of course, there was the. Uh, uh, McDougal Hill was very difficult to climb. So even if the Edmonton Yukon Pacific Railway came over the bridge and ended up at the bottom of the hill, uh, they still had to get um, horses and, and carriages and um, up the hill. So the funicular uh, went up to the top and ended up at 101st Street. What you see at the top left is uh, McDougal Church and the funicular went up there. Uh, these are all basic photos of that era. So basically the 1910-12 was probably our biggest boom. Our population literally tripled in two years. Okay, so the institutional buildings, legislature was built and um, you can see at the bottom in the middle, the legislature is under construction. Uh, that's about, it opened in 1912. So that's probably about 1911. Okay, the second city would be Strathcona. So the uh, Calgary Edmonton Railway, as we said, arrived in 1891. Uh, the the uh, photo on the left is um, is basically the 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 original train station. That's uh, that would be in front of what um, the new 1905 train station is. It's, it would be the, the uh, northeast corner of 103rd or Gateway and uh, White Avenue. And, um, and, the, uh, uh, and then of course, um, Kitty Corner to that was with the South Edmonton Hotel, which is, became the Strathcona Hotel. So the Canadian Pacific Railway um, decided it was going to build a competitive settlement on the south side. And, um, and it, uh, it did what the Hudson's Bay Company did. It, it uh, dug out a main road, uh, called it White Avenue after William White, who was a vice president of uh, the Canadian Pacific Railway and was, was the man who basically brought the Canadian Pacific Railway into the Edmonton area. Uh, the settlement grew enough that, um, that in 1899, South Edmonton became the town of Strathcona. So 
1902, these are sort of significant things. Uh, there were a lot of fires on the prairie at, uh, at uh, we can, <laughs> not much has changed. Uh, and um, and uh, so different towns, Lacombe actually burned down at one point. So Strathcona decided they were gonna create a, a, a bylaw banning wooden buildings. Um, just to give you, I think some of you will recognize top left as uh, White Avenue. Uh, there's the uh, the map of uh, Edmonton and Strathcona, and uh, and then on the bottom is the the map of of now the the city of Strathcona the, uh, in 1907. The middle top it was the city hall, and um, and that was uh, where uh, McIntyre Park is now. The building is gone, but it would have been um, it would have been on the uh, Probably where um, uh, where the fountain uh, is, or the, the replica of the fountain, and um, and then of course uh, as the as the town and city grew, that's what it looked like on on the bottom. Uh, so it became a city in 1907, and um, and then um, in 1912, Strathcona built the area's first library. So the Strathcona Library is the oldest library in Edmonton. 1910, it became obvious uh, because of the railways on the north side that that's where you needed to be. And, and, um, and so the Canadian Pacific Railway decided that, uh, that they would now build the bridge over, um, over the North Saskatchewan. And, and, um, and of course, they built the first bridge that... Um, uh, that would connect top of bank to top of bank. You didn't have to go deep into the valley. You, you, uh, it, was, it was basically a straightforward over the top of the bank and probably where the was part of the river is. Now, it was also the first bridge in Canada that had four different transportation um, types. So it would have on the, on the bottom deck was uh, pedestrian and, and um, uh, at that time, carriages and, and even some cars. We Our first car arrived in 1904. So there were cars by 1912 or 13 when it opened. And the top deck had the uh, Canadian Pacific Railway, the big train that ran down the center. And on both sides of it was um, were the streetcar tracks. So the streetcar and the trains ran on the top deck and um, people and vehicles were on the bottom deck. 1912, the citizen. Now, you'll notice, I think, uh, one of the things that becomes obvious about um, amalgamating municipalities is that there's always a dominant municipality and then there are competing municipalities who, um, who grow quickly and can't afford their own infrastructure because they're competing for labor and they're competing for um, for materials. And so generally what happens is that, um, is that they amalgamate so that they can get a better deal on their infrastructure and they can grow without bankrupting themselves. And this is what happened to Strathcona in 1912. The citizens actually, uh, well, narrowly decided that they would become part of the city of Edmonton. Okay, we're gonna go to villages because that's the, um, uh, uh, chronologically, the, the next uh, the, these are the next events. So the village of North Edmonton, which is now the Fort Road area, um, became um, an important place in 1905 when the Canadian Northern Railway came through and the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway. And basically, um, both of the railways converged there. And that made it a good place to build the the packing plants and um, and also the stockyards. So in 1908, um, Swifts comes in and they build a packing plant. Uh, the Transit Hotel is built. Um, my favorite, this is the, the pig herd is one of my favorite photos. Uh, you know, we, we see we see a lot of, of cow herds, but it has, but you know, pigs too. Uh, they got off the train and had to walk to the stockyards. 1911 to 13, Burns builds their packing plant. 
And Edmonton, the Edmonton stockyards became so um, important in that area. They were the second largest in North America. Only Chicago's Union stockyards were larger uh, in on the continent. Okay, it was, um, I think most of us know that it became the packing town. And um, same kind of thing. You can see that uh, this was a this was a settlement that grew around the packing area, and um, and it had um, no amenities. There was no running water. There were there were no sewers. There were no telephones. None of the things that the city had. Um, it was an inexpensive place to live, but again, no amenities. And so, in order to get those amenities. Uh, they decided that they were going to amalgamate with the city of Edmonton. So 1912, again, and Edmonton was quite happy to take them at that point because the packing plants were a huge economic boost. The village of West Edmonton, we know now as Calder, and, um, and I, I know we don't think of Calder as West, but it was at that time. And uh, the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway came in. Uh, it located on 127th Avenue, which again was um, north of 118th Avenue. So it wanted to stay out of the Hudson's Bay Reserve and, um, and it set up uh, its, uh, its headquarters on 127th. So in 1908, there was a, a tent city that, um, that grew around, um, around the, uh, the freight, uh, the, well, their freight yards and, and all of the buildings that the, the uh, Grand Trunk Pacific put up. Um, so it was decided that um, 1910 that the village would grow there, and it was uh, it was it was established as a village at that point. And I guess it's called Calder because the Calder Land Company in 19 um, was formed in 1907. So um, Hugh Calder and his partner began marketing 160 acres of West Edmonton Village. And they were offered um, at $175, or if you wanted a quarter lot, you would have to pay $224. And so there were uh, about 500 people that became residents almost immediately. Uh, Calder's Bronx subdivision went on sale in 1912. So this was um, the, uh, a subdivision that was next to the original one. 1,200 lots were sold in three days for $400 each. So um, big money. The village was registered, uh, registered as West Edmonton, and it was, but it was, again, called Calder. In 1915, uh, they didn't have sewers, electricity, city water, or telephones. And they began negotiations to merge in 1913, and the city of Edmonton really didn't want them. Um, it, um, 1913 was an economic crash. And all of the um, Edmonton itself, one of the reasons that people would live in places like Calder and, and surrounding uh, municipalities was because they couldn't afford to live in Edmonton. There was a lot of land speculation and, um, and people were flipping properties constantly. The city had serviced a large number of lots, not all of them, but a large number. And um, and so uh, people in in the Calder area in West the village of West Edmonton uh, wanted I think more even than sewers and water they wanted the streetcar, and um, and so it was it was negotiated and finally in 1917, uh, the second last year of the war, um, the Edmonton took over uh, the Calder area. So towns. These are more recent. So the first town was the town of Beverly. And uh, in its story begins at the bottom of Grierson Hill. The, a man named William Helmerstone and his wife Beata uh, were, um, were mining. Uh, if you know the history of McDougall Hill and Grierson Hill, it's basically punctured full of, of, uh, of coal mining, uh, well, I suppose they're tunnels because they really weren't shafts. They were, they were tunnels. You would just drill into the side of a hill, put up a few wooden supports and dig the coal out and run away. 
and um, and it was uh, it was there that Humberstone built the coal mine, and um, and he actually had a brickyard as well, and all at the bottom of of um, what is now Grierson Hill. So 1899 was one of our famous floods. The river came up and took out the Humberstone coal mine. It also took out the Humberstone house, and um, and the. Um, at that, and the town of Edmonton in, um, in 1900 um, was uh, was starting to put the um, restrictions on coal mining in the town itself because it was what it was doing is it was compromising the hill. In 1901, Grierson Hill was a major landslide. It um, it took out half the hill. It just crumbled to the bottom of of. Uh, and into Rossdale. So that was the end of mining uh, on Grierson. And so William and, and his wife Beata and, and their investors went east and they claimed the property south of 108, what is now 118th Avenue and east of 34th Street. And um, the Clover Bar seam is probably the largest uh, coal mining or the coal seam in, in the area. It's absolutely huge. And frankly, it's still there. I mean, Edmonton sits on a lot of coal. And um, uh, the, there was a clover bar mine across the river and, um, and they started the Humberstone mine. Now, there were up to 500 uh, mining operations in that area. A lot of them were, were seasonal. People would come in, they dig a, a tunnel, they grab some coal, decide it wasn't worth it and run away. So, but there were three major operations that stayed for quite a while and, um, and had a big impact on what Beverly was. They were the Bush mines, the old one and the, and the Bush Davidson mines. And, and Davidson was important because um, he was, um, uh, he subdivided uh, the village and town of Beverly. But, and then of course, uh, coal mining, the Beverly coal mine was a whole other story. So 1913, the village of Beverly was incorporated and in 1914, it became a town. Now uh, the east or the, the western boundary of Beverly was 50th Street. So the, the, uh, that was the end of Edmonton and the beginning of Beverly. So if you cross 50th Street, you were either uh, in Edmonton or in Beverly. Coal mining was the main industry Agriculture included market gardens and fox and meat uh, farms as well. They sit on some, Edmonton sits on some of the best black dirt in North America. And, um, and so farming is, uh, and especially market garden farming, you can, you can be quite successful on, on a very small acreage. Okay, so 1920, um, well, I'm, Going to see back up a bit here. Hang on. Oh, I'm going to tell you the story of the um, of their first town hall. That's what you see in the large photo there, and it's um, it was built in 1917 um, and designed by the architect Alan Jeffers, who was also the architect for the Alberta Legislature. One of the big issues with this building was that it was built in 1917 and. Uh, there was a labor shortage and uh, a material shortage because it was the war and um, and the war had been going on for three years at that point. So there was, I think there were some construction compromises. Now they did use the second story as a dance hall and, and uh, an event place. And, and the theory is they kind of danced the building to death. Uh, on the bottom was the, um, uh, the town hall, or of course the, the the and also oh the jail, as well as they they had a pen at the back for stray horses and cows and pigs and anything else that arrived that wasn't supposed to be hanging around town without somebody looking after it, and the um, um, and there was also the magistrate's office, the Alberta magistrate. So Emily Murphy was uh, used to hold court in this building. It. Um, of course, as I said, it was compromised and had to uh, and had to be demolished eventually. Now, in 1920, um, the Beverly had um, uh, 
sent quite a few men to war in 1914 and, um, and several of them didn't come back. So they built the first uh, memorial cenotaph in Alberta. This is now a designated cenotaph, uh, municipal cenotaph. And, um, and it has a, you know, it has federal importance as well. It, um, it was, it is the oldest in Alberta. Uh, the uh, Beverly Mine, the depression, uh, well, I guess we'll back up a bit because by 1927, the city of Edmonton had, um, had changed its buildings over to natural gas. And it was sort of the beginning of the end for, for coal. The depression was was a big deal because the, the, the life of the town depended very much on coal. And, um, uh, and at that time, there was no safety net. There was no provincial safety net. If you were a family that had lost its income, who couldn't support itself or even an, an individual, what you had to do is you had to go to the town council and you had to make a case for help. And this was virtually every time. So if you needed help, in May, uh, you would go again in June, and July, and August, and basically it was a, be a begging mission. You know, they they would give you whatever small amount they could afford, and and of course this basically was this was very difficult on municipalities because um, many of them didn't have incomes, and Beverly was one of those. So a scheme came up. They were going to build a coal mine, and the um, uh, the town and um, and the coal miners and everyone else were. Uh, we're going to get um, investment certificates. They were they were going to uh, get the vouchers, and that's how they were going to be paid out of the out of the um, uh, proceeds. Now, the Beverly Mine was a big mine, and you can see it has a tipple. The tipple is the is the uh, is is the big tower, and it's basically a sorting device. So this is where the shafts come in. They dig a shaft down into. Um, into the earth, and then they build tunnels that extend from the shaft, and they have an elevator system that basically brings people and coal up and down into the shafts or into the into the tunnels, and um, and so the the um, Beverly Mine was where Jubilee Park is now, which is on the north side of 118th Avenue, and um, uh, and they built several tunnels. A lot of them. Edmonton also has a high water table. So not surprisingly, it flooded, and there was um, uh, and um, they did bring up coal. But by the time they got going, it was too late. They lost a lot of money, and um, and of course the miners didn't get paid. It was um, uh, in 1938 the province of Alberta the the town basically went bankrupt. And so the province of Alberta took over the administration until 1949 when they were able to get their town council back up. However, if the post Second World War, ran, we had a boom again and we had and uh, we, we'd had a, a housing shortage all through the war. The Americans had been in Edmonton from 1942 and we'd had an exploding economy. We didn't go into a recession in the Second World War because the Americans not only brought their military, but they brought 10,000 support workers and, um, and a lot of money got left here. So again, people couldn't afford to buy land and property in Edmonton. So they moved out to the surrounding municipalities. There was a huge explosion of population explosion in Beverly in the 50s. They couldn't afford their infrastructure. So they became part of Edmonton in, 19, in late 1961 um, as one of the business owners um, at that, uh, who remembers that uh, tells the story of going into um, the Beverly Heights Community Hall for New Year's Eve in Beverly and coming out in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. Town of Jasper Place. So night, um, 1910, Jasper Place was mostly a farm area, and um, and its homes again had no water, sewer, electricity, or telephone services. Uh, the city of Edmonton at that point was in a boom period, and again, speculators had raised the cost of property, uh, and they were asking Edmonton to amalgamate. 
Uh, and Edmonton said, no, you're too expensive. We can't afford you. So they didn't. What they did do is they moved the border from 142nd to 149th. So they basically took the high end real estate. And, um, and so in 1912, the um, 1913, the western border of Edmonton was 149th Street. And if any of you drive down Stony Plain Road and you see that turnabout on the, on the south side, uh, just east of 149th Street for the bus, that was the end of it. Uh, those of us who grew up in this city and had those little green bus tickets remember taking an adventure tour down to the end of the city and then trying to convince the bus driver that we were too little to walk back home again. So it, it always worked. <laughs> there was the, um, okay, so anyway, uh, the residents law, uh, lobbied again for me to, uh, for the amalgamation and they kept doing this, of course, um, that didn't happen. Again, same as Beverly, the population exploded after the Second World War for the very same reasons that it exploded in the first place was uh, there was uh, there was no decent property values in, in the city of Edmonton. And um, so uh, it was it was always um, uh, it was always a municipal district in the same way that Sherwood Park will never become a town or a city because they need the taxes from the industrial area, they will always be part of a county. And that's what was going on with Jasper Place is that they were, they were part of the county rather than, the, uh, than incorporating until 1950. And it looked like they were going to win this game because people were moving out and they're all of those uh, suburbs that attach themselves to the center of, uh, of Jasper Place. And, and if you drive through the Jasper Place area or west of 149th Street, you'll see that there are a lot of 1950s subdivisions. And that was, that was part of this huge explosion. So the population was um, had doubled. It was almost 9,000 people. It was advertised as a young giant. It was actually the biggest town in uh, in Alberta, it was it was it was huge. I mean, you know, when you have nine or ten thousand people, uh, you really uh, could be a city, <laughs> and and they were still a town, and they were famous for late night shopping and for their industrial areas. Now, the um, at that time in the sixties um, and prior, the city of Edmonton closed down. They had a bylaw where they closed down their shops at 5.30 or 6. And the only night you could stay open was at, um, it was Thursday night. And so you couldn't shop on Sundays, you couldn't shop in the evenings, uh, except Thursday. And there was a time even prior to that where they, uh, the, the big stores, the, the downtown basically closed on Wednesday afternoon. So that, uh, so their staff had that half day off so they could work Thursday evening. Um, and, but, Jasper Place became famous for its late night shopping. They stayed open until eight o'clock every night. And, um, and that was, it drew a lot of people from Edmonton because, you know, they come home from work, they have to pick up stuff. So off they go to Jasper Place. Uh, the um, same issues, they didn't have paved streets, they didn't have sewers, they didn't have telephone, they didn't have any of that electricity or any of, of that. Well, they had uh, very limited uh, amenities. And, um, and that area has a lot of clay. So it became quite famous as, as the, the mud town. Um, it, it, but they kept building. So 1963, the Jasper Place High School. And finally, in August of 1964, they convinced the city of Edmonton to amalgamate. So here's a map of, um, of the annexations uh, going back to 1899. And as you can see, uh, it includes, of course, the, uh, uh, the municipalities. And then this is, uh, this is uh, I have to apologize, this is an older map. I couldn't find one that was, that was a little more current. Uh, where it says proposed, that's already part of Edmonton. That's the that's the part that Edmonton just took in uh, in through the uh, Leduc County area. So the Edmonton boundaries have not remained the same since 1982. So any of the dark blue areas have come in since 1982, and that's that that uh, the bottom part. Um, 
we were talking about, I think at one of my presentations, if somebody said, well, you know, what's the footprint of Edmonton? Well, to 1982, the footprint of Edmonton was, um, uh, was 525 square miles. The, um, the, if you compare the population to the city of San Francisco, which has the same population, uh, you would, uh, they are 49 square miles. So we have a lot of land <laughs> that isn't residential. Okay, um, so thank you for staying awake for most of this. <laughs> and if there are any questions or any comments, I'd be happy to hear them. Thank okay. you so much for that, uh, Shirley. Wondering if you could uh, stop sharing your screen so that we can see the uh, the places. But I uh, I see Joan has a comment in uh, in the chat. Would you like to talk to that, Joan? Yes, um, I was. I never knew my birthplace for many years, and as a single mom with two small children, I found out that. Edmonton was actually my birthplace and uh, I had never lived in the city but I did come to live in the city from the rural areas of Alberta in the 90s and I was always very proud of it and was I would go around to anybody who would listen and say it's Edmonton it's my town I was born here <laughs> <laughs> it's an awesome city thank you do you, do you know what hospital you were born in did they give you yeah that? the Miz the Miz, I was going to say, I bet it was yeah. the Miz. <laughs> yeah, my daddy was a coal miner. He was a bad boy. He disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Miz. Jan. Yeah. Oops. Go ahead. Uh, Jan, I see you have your hand up. Oh, when, Shirley, were you finished commenting to Joan? I was just going to say that the Miz, of course, uh, was on 111th Street and 99th Avenue at that time. Um, it was. It didn't move to the West until 1969. So... It was, uh, but it was the maternity hospital. It was, yeah. yeah. Well, if I may, I have I have so many questions, Shirley, but I'll just try a couple if there's time. Um, when Strathcona didn't make it as a town, would would it because they weren't liberal and didn't receive a, a grant from the government for their infrastructure? Oh no, I mean Rutherford was a Strathconian. As a matter of fact, the reason that the university was in um, Strathcona was the uh, was the university city. It, be, it became a city in 1907. The reason that they amalgamated was because um, they were they started to boom and they couldn't afford all of their infrastructure. So the deal that they made with Edmonton was that they would get all their streets paved before Edmonton did, and uh, and so they um, so Strathcona was. Uh, was paved uh, all the suburban well as much as suburban happened in in, in 1912 uh, before the suburbs in in Edmonton were paved now the downtown of Edmonton was paved early on it was it was paved way before 1910 but the um, uh, but uh, it was um, uh, Rutherford was a liberal. He was the first premier of Alberta, and he was, and it was the reason that uh, that Edmonton became the capital city um, of the province. He was also, um, as you know, the first chancellor of the or the you know he the, the, the University of Alberta, and his there was a competition between Calgary and Edmonton at that time about who would get the Alberta University. And uh, and so Rutherford promised that neither Calgary or Edmonton would be would would get the university, so he built it in the city of Strathcona. And actually, it was the town of Strathcona at that time because it was, no, it was 1908, so so it was the city of Strathcona. So that's how we got this, the University of Alberta. Is there time for one more, Eric? I think so. Um, I, I, ha I have a question though. I, you know, or just a just a rough comment is I grew up in Montreal and so in Quebec I know that you know if you were driving in the country you were driving on a beautiful paved road and suddenly it would end and become a gravel road and you knew that that that's where the voting line ended I wasn't aware of the fact that uh, so many of the same things happened in western Canada so good on that I, and I'm sorry I, I I just wanted to jump in with that but Jan did you have another question uh, yeah, I did. Sh Shirley, we saw pictures of brick buildings. 
throughout your presentation, would most of those bricks come from JB Little's Brickyard, his brick company? There were a whole bunch of brick companies, lots of them. And uh, as a matter of fact, I have a book on all of the Alberta bri brickyards. Uh, they were, and there were a lot of masons. They had a lot of skills. Um, they were, um, they brought them from Europe and, and the Eastern cities. But um, there was uh, the Pollard Brickyard uh, was uh, where the, uh, on the south leg of the LRT bridge um, now, uh, there was the Sanderson Brickyard, there was the, the Riverdale or the JB Little Brickyard. And, um, and even uh, when we were doing, when we were saving the Gibson block, uh, a lot of those buildings have two brick walls. You know, they have an interior brick wall and an exterior brick wall, and the brick walls are huge, right? And, um, and the exterior brick wall was, uh, came from the Medicine Hat area. So that, that's where they, uh, yeah, they just, they had, they had better clay, frankly. Um, but, um, but the, a lot of the brick building, especially the, 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 the more orange the brick is, the more local it is. And, um, and they were, you know, brick, the brickyards came and went, but they were, uh, yeah, Little was, a, was a longtime brick company. So was Pollard. Uh, Sanderson, unfortunately, was killed at his brickyard. So that was the end of that one. But the, um, uh, but yeah, no, it was, yeah, little was a big deal. And Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more quick question, if anybody. Uh, Karen, I see you waving your hand. I worked for a while in, uh, in uh, Calgary. And while I was there, this goes back to the competition between Edmonton and Calgary. What I was told about the University of Alberta was that the premier was in a bind and he made a political promise that the University of Alberta would be established south of the river. And that apparently swayed people, but they didn't realize that Calgary, I think this is the root cause of the antagonism with Calgary and, and Edmonton because they felt that they were taken uh, by that ruse. So it was, uh, that was the a whole bunch of causes even earlier than that one was that the train went to calgary and didn't come to edmonton and um and then of course uh the various conservative governments that were you know so it was always i mean it's it's a big deal uh, yes the university didn't help <laughs> <There was. laughs> wonderful Jan, go ahead. I, I just could hear all day shirley i'm just loving your presentation um who owned the railroads uh, okay, well, the railroad stories, the um, um, Canadian Pacific, the Calgary Edmonton Railway was was uh, a subsidiary, basically the real estate arm of the uh, Canadian Pacific Railway. And, um, and they were an investment group. Now, all of the railways, I don't think there's any major industry in, in Canada that didn't, didn't uh, start out with huge piles of, of uh, public money and lots of land settlements like you know they um so the, the land right of way right wherever a railway is they own that land and the only jurisdiction is federal okay so the city of edmonton has absolutely no jurisdiction over any railway land and um uh, as it doesn't have any jurisdiction over the university land so the so the Canadian pacific railway came up in 1891 uh, the uh, Canadian Northern Railway and Grand Trunk Pacific in 1905-1909. Again, they were investments, right? These were these were um, groups of people who put in money, got huge grants from the <laughs> from the government, and um, and pushed the railway through. Uh, it was a big deal because it basically opened the land up for settlement, and. Um, uh, because, you know, uh, before that, if you were on the Red River cart, first of all, you didn't take a Red River cart, you walked beside a Red River cart and you walked for three months. So if you need to hike to Winnipeg, take lunches for three months. There's um, uh, the, um, uh, but the railways went bankrupt, uh, the Grand Trunk Pacific uh, in 1916. And uh, and then the Canadian Northern and, and this and the Dominion of, of Canada, the Canadian government uh, amalgamated them all into the Canadian National. So they became a government. Um, they became a government industry until they were sold to the Americans in the nineties. 
Wonderful. Shirley, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. I am I I need to talk to you, but I think you should come back for next season because your your knowledge of, of Edmonton is so fantastic. And I've I've lived here for 40 years. And as I walk around, I can see the changes that have happened in the city in the time that I've been here. But it's always so interesting to look back and think, how did that get to be there? So I'd really like to invite you back for next season to chat a little bit more. This has been absolutely fantastic. I'd like to thank you very much. And um, thank everybody for attending. Uh, just a reminder that next week uh, we've got uh, Aaron LaFuente, who is going to talk about estate planning, a very important uh, component for anybody of our of a certain age, should we say, not our age, but of a certain age. Um, so please join us then. And uh, Shirley, I'm going to invite you into a uh, breakout room just so that we can have a quick chat afterwards. This main room will stay open until about uh, 10 after or 15 after noon. If anybody wants to chat among themselves, uh, what else have I forgotten to say? I think that's about it. Jan, any final comments? Unless um, uh, Shirley has a last word or an event to advertise. Yes, please. I, okay, now, I, I just wanna thank everybody for uh, for showing up. I know it's it's the middle of the day and, and people have, have the lives. Uh, and I understand uh, and hopefully that people will, will watch the presentation uh, again. Um, the, um, uh, the, again, if, uh, if you haven't considered it, um, uh, the Edmonton District Historical Society does really good work in the community and runs a, a festival in July that uh, that takes you through free tours and, and, um, and into some important buildings as part of the Heritage Festival. So put that on your calendar, look it up, look them up, see if you want to join, be part of that. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. I uh, really appreciate wonderful, wonderful presentation.